Hello and welcome to the first episode of Ships, Sea and the Stars from Royal Museums Greenwich. We're going to be bringing you fabulous stories of the sea, space, history and creativity with lots of different Royal Museums Greenwich curators and special guests. I'm Helen Chersky. We're going to be making one of these every week. Uh, and each one will be available afterwards as a podcast and or a video on YouTube. So you'll be able to find all the links to all of the episodes at the Royal Museums Greenwich website, which is rmg.co.uk. And then if you have forward slash museum from home, you'll find lots of activities, a huge list of things that the museum is doing while we can't actually go in the physical building. So. Even though we're all at home, uh, Royal Museums Greenwich is still there. There are four main sites, the Cutty Sark, the National Maritime Museum, the Royal Observatory and the Queen's House. And between them, they've got a fabulous collection of history and culture and art that relate to all periods of history. Um, and we're very lucky to have that collection. And so, so that you don't miss out while we're all stuck at home, we're going to be bringing so, uh, lots of things from the collection and all the wonderful expertise of the museum's fabulous curators to share with you uh, during these episodes. So if there's a question that you'd like to ask or a topic that you'd like to talk about, please get in contact with us. We'd love to hear from you. And the ways to do that are on Facebook. I oh, don't know what that was. Just invented a new social media service. And um, the ways to do it are on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram. And if you search for Royal Museums Greenwich on any of those three services, you'll find us and you can send us your questions and comments. So this week, we're going to be talking about isolation. Lots of us recently have had the relatively new experience of, of being isolated at home, which sounds like a strange thing. But actually, when you look back through history, plenty of humans have been isolated in lots of different ways throughout history. And so actually for humans, it's nothing new. There have been sailors and explorers who were stuck in cramped conditions in tents or on boats. There's um, confinement of a different sort when Tudor queens, for example, were stuck inside waiting for childbirth. Um, and there's lots of examples of people who faced isolation, maybe that they were expecting and maybe that they weren't. So we're going to ask the question, what can history tell us about our current situation? What, how did those men and women deal with all of that? What did they do? How did they cope? And, and maybe some lessons about what it can teach us today. So I... One of the reasons I'm I'm fascinated by this topic, because my academic work is as an ocean physicist, which means I go out to sea, I work on big research ships for um, usually a month or two at a time. And so I've spent lots of time isolated at sea. And there are a lot of similarities between that and our current situation. Um, there are a few differences. Uh, you know, there's Internet and the floor doesn't move. But that feeling of being, you know, only able to go to three or four places for weeks and weeks on end is quite similar. Um, so we have three fabulous uh, curators from the museum who are going to help us explore the topics and the themes that run through history with all of this. Uh, we've got Robert Blythe, who is the senior curator of world and maritime history. All curators have excellent job titles. Um, Sue Pritchard, who is the senior arts curator, and we also have Claire Warrior, who is the senior exhibitions interpretation curator. So for, to get started, I'm just going to ask each of you, just give us a little brief overview of your take on isolation, and how, how your area of expertise crosses over with the topic of isolation. Um, Claire, perhaps you can go first. Um, so my research interest is in the polar regions and polar exploration, and in some ways that tells us a lot about isolation par excellence. It's about um, isolation in extreme conditions in some of the harshest environments on Earth. Um, and it's about sometimes relatively small groups of people being stuck with each other for relatively long periods of time, stuck indoors in huts or on ships. And um, really, I think what it tells us a lot about is about sociability and about the need to be able to get on with each other because you can't go on that kind of an expedition and not be a sociable person. Sometimes people think about the polar regions and exploration and they think about a lone solitary person, particularly because we tend to remember great names like Scott and Shackleton and so on. Okay, right. Uh, but actually, you're able to get on with people. 
you've got to be able to get on with people. Okay, that is that is definitely a good tip. Right. Uh, Sue, tell us a little bit about your interest in isolation. Well, I'm particularly interested in women's history. Um, and, you know, throughout history, um, women have been confined and incarcerated to changes in the political landscape, through illness, through charges of sexual impropriety, but also, most importantly, through childbirth. And childbirth was a highly ritualized life cycle event. Um, and the confinement was very gendered. Um, women, uh, particularly Tudor queens and uh, aristocratic women, would be um, confined within their chambers with their ladies of the bedchamber. So it was highly, highly gendered. And this uh, in itself caused charges of um, um, women as gossip. They were, they, they were transgressing. Uh, the normal situation where um, men had um, power over their their space. So um, I'm particularly interested in how women navigated that space and um, how it was perceived externally, because it's a very internalised world. Fabulous. And last but not least, Robert. Um, well, I suppose in some ways for any seafarer, life at sea is isolating. You've been taken away from your, um, from land, from your home, from your family, and you are, depending on which period you're in, you, you may have no form of communication with the outside world. So actually, you become enclosed within your wooden walls, if you want, um, and your, your fate is with the commanding officer and the vagaries of, of nature. So it's, it's isolation of a slightly different kind. Fabulous. Right. Well, to set the scene, um, we're going to hear an excerpt from possibly one of the most famous diaries of history, and that is Robert Falcon Scott's diary uh, on the Terra Nova expedition in 1911. And this is read by Simon Kane. Journals, Robert Falcon Scott. Tuesday, June the 6th, 1911. The temperature has been as high as plus 19 degrees today. The south wind persisted until the evening with clear sky, except for fine effects of torn cloud round about the mountain. Tonight the moon has emerged from behind the mountain and sails across the cloudless northern sky. The wind has fallen and the scene is glorious. It is my birthday. A fact I might easily have forgotten, but my kind people did not. At lunch, an immense birthday cake made its appearance and we were photographed about it. Clissel had decorated its sugared top with various devices in chocolate and crystallised fruit, flags and photographs of myself. After my walk, I discovered that great preparations were in progress for a special dinner, and when the hour for that meal arrived, we sat down to a sumptuous spread with our sledge banners hung about us. Clissel's especially excellent seal soup, roast mutton and red currant jelly, fruit salad, asparagus and chocolate. Such was our menu. For drink, we had cider cup, a mystery not yet fathomed, some sherry and a liqueur. After this luxurious meal, everyone was very festive and amiably argumentative. As I write, there is a group in the dark room discussing political progress with large discussions, another at one corner of the dinner table airing its views on the origin of matter and the probability of its ultimate discovery, and yet another debating military problems. The scraps that reached me from the various groups pieced together in ludicrous fashion. Perhaps these arguments are practically unprofitable, but they give a great deal of pleasure to the participants. They are boys, all of them, but such excellent, good-natured ones. There has been no sign of sharpness or anger, no jarring note in all these wordy contests. All end with a laugh. So I love there is so much in that reading, isn't there? Perhaps each could ask each of you to pick out your favourite bit. I'm going to start actually with my favourite bit, which is the idea of seal soup. I, I sort of associate seal, you know, having to, I associate soup with kind of higher levels of cooking in a way. And I associate eating seal to survive with kind of lumps of meat that have been hacked off and cooked in the most primitive way possible. And that, the, the, the idea of seal soup really shocks me because I had never thought of someone applying higher cooking techniques to, um, you know, eating seals in the Antarctic. So I, I really like that mismatch. How about the rest of you? What are your favourite bits of that? Well, I think for me, it's, it's that, that phrase, my people, and that sense of actually creating your own family in extreme circumstances. Um, and there's a very, very poignant reference to they're just boys. So I think there's something quite poignant in the way of thinking about this group of men who, who within a, a very different type of domestic environment, 
at desperately trying to celebrate somebody's birthday. Robert, how about you? Well, well I mean, it's all of those food references. I mean, these expeditions were lavishly catered for. You know, I mean, um, Claire will be able to say more, but I mean, some of them, I think Fortnum and Mason did the did the supplies for. So, you know, it's top quality polar hamper that you're you're tucking into. <laughs> yeah. And um, I mean, and this is really good. And I think there's one disastrous expedition where the report comes through that they've left the case of champagne outside and it's frozen and the bottles have broken <laughs> you know and i mean i that's the sort of shock in isolation that i probably wouldn't be able to get over i don't think <laughs> Claire, the champagne, the champagne yeah. sludgy, sludgy. <laughs> yeah <laughs> well if you've not got many pleasures to look forward to i'm sure champagne is something you protect very much claire how about you what's the bits that stand out for you from that well, I clearly think with my stomach, too, because the food is one of the things that really rings true. And I guess we can all see that a little bit at the moment when, you know, kind of getting food into people's houses is really, really important to all of us. But because um, especially I'm thinking because my parents are older and I'm trying to make sure that I can keep them supplied with things. Um, but it's quite interesting that they talk about talking about things like politics and the conversations, because actually, often they wouldn't have had those kind of discussions because they would have tried to talk about things that wouldn't cause any controversy. And it feels to me a bit like that kind of after Christmas dinner moment where everybody's had a little bit too much to drink and they start talking about subjects and then wishing that they'd never started them at all. So just that kind of moment for a little bit of release maybe. That, I also find that's an interesting idea because I definitely have there are some little there are this more serious like you know the fundamental politics type debates that you don't want to get into but my experience of being at sea is that there are some little arguments that you agree to have because they're entertaining in the in the years before the internet I once had a three-week argument debate with someone over the difference between duct tape and gaffer tape <laughs> and it kept both of us entertained for three weeks. And that is what you get these in jokes building up and they become really important and they build and build until you're speaking a language that no one in the outside world understands. Um, so let's let's use that to get to our first object then. And uh, so we, the way we're going to work this is each of we, we've got several objects from the museum's collections that are going to speak to these issues. And the first one uh, Claire chose and it is related to the reading because it's Robert Falcon Scott's book bag. Claire, tell us a little bit about what this object is. Yes, yeah, so I guess, as you said, really, one of the things that um, Scott is most famous for is for the diary. We remember him through his words. Um, and those words are really important in terms of some of the things that we've just been talking about, because writing down words that you might not want to speak to your colleagues having a place where you could express your feelings was really, really important. Journals and diaries were an important way of managing mental health in a place like the polls. Um, but it's also something that becomes important to convey a sense of experience back home um, because the number of people that go to somewhere like Antarctica is relatively small and the kind of conditions and the experiences that people have are actually quite difficult for others to imagine. So having something where you can write your words down and then they may well be published when you get back home is really important. And the diary thing is interesting as well. And, and I, you know, because if you look back, we get so much from people's diaries and it's clear that it's more than just I'm a bit bored. Maybe I'll write down what I did. There does seem to be this human urge to record. Um, and I think you're right about the mental health, because I don't know about you, but I've done this at sea for years. Is I, I write, I keep a diary of what I've done that day and it helps me. Um, it helps me feel the days of something's happening each day because all the days look the same. Mm -hmm. But I did do different things. Um, how about the diaries in the context of, uh, you know, Robert and Sue? Uh, is, uh, do you find diaries written at all times in history? Well, I mean, certainly sailors, officers will be keeping a, a log. You know, so they will be writing things down about the voyage and they may be desperately dull things like wind direction, wind speed, you know, um, the, the handling of, of the ship. But at the same time, people are also taking personal notes as well, making sketches. And, and you know, when we come to talk about, you know, William Bly and his experience on the bounty, you know, he's doing exactly that in some of the most difficult conditions he's still putting pen to paper and is still noting things down. 
And and Sue, do, do women in history have women have women written diaries as much as men? Because you know they they wouldn't have had the prominence, but were they still writing by themselves for perhaps only themselves to read? Yes, and quite often women are are recording their family history and narrating the family history to be handed down. So it's very much about life cycle events. It is about um, birth, death, marriage, um, but also you, women are using different forms of writing. So they are quite often use stitch and they record um, events through stitch as a way Maybe of... Maybe explain that a little bit more, because I think that might be an idea that not so many people are familiar with. Well, um, most famously through samplers. So samplers were teaching aids, but you also get women who are actually stitching um, biographical details in their samplers, and they also do it in their quilt making as well. There's a lot of mythology around the idea that women would cut up their love letters and use them as templates for quilting. But that's, that's a bit rubbish. You wouldn't actually, you know, cut up a love letter, which is something that is very precious. You would actually bind it in a ribbon and put it in a safe place. They're using plain paper templates. But what they are actually doing is perhaps stitching um, biographical details onto their quilt so that they can hand down that family history and quite often repurposing a quilt. So they will make a quilt. Um, and inscribe it with the name and the birth date of a child. And then when that child is older, they will gift that quilt to the, often the female member um, of the family when they're about to have their own child. So textiles are a really interesting way in which women narrate, narrate their family history. And Claire, these, uh, these diaries were particularly important for um, Scott, I guess, because he knew that the public interest in these expeditions, I mean, that, that was what funded him, wasn't it? That, that this was, he had to, it wasn't just the adventure for the sake of doing it or the science, but he knew that he had to get people interested in this. Absolutely. And that link to sort of funding is is a really important one. I mean, you can see, especially towards the end of Scott's diary, that he's certainly writing it knowing that he's not going to make it back, but that hoping that his journals will. And that's why he makes the sort of final plea, you know, please, God, look after our people, that he wants his family to be looked after and all the families of the people that are in the polar party trying to make it to the South Pole, because he's hoping that his words might come back where he might not. But yeah, absolutely. Um, other explorers like Ernest Shackleton went on lecture tours and would have published their words to make sure that their stories would be reaching as wide a, a, a group of people as possible. Well, I suspect that the call for lecture tours after our current, uh, after the COVID-19 crisis is over, <laughs> lecture tours on everyone's experiences might be uh, short. <laughs> And that would be a really interesting (laughs) take because, of course, as I say, you know, women were um, keeping diaries, which was about the domestic landscape. They are not going out, you know, on explorations. They're very much focused in the context of the home, which we all are at the moment. Are any of you keeping a diary? You don't have to tell me what you're writing in it. Have any of you picked up this habit yet? Nope. <laughs> admitting to it. Okay, let's let's move on then to um, Sue. Now, your your first object is a picture of a building. So, tell us what this building is. So basically, it's the uh, Palace of Placentia, and it's where um, Anne Boleyn actually um, had her lying in and her confinement um, prior to the birth of Elizabeth I, um, uh, Queen Elizabeth. Um, and she, as I say, childbirth was highly ritualized and very prescribed. There was an expectation amongst women of the Tudor court that they would have a period of a month before their due delivery date when they would actually enter their chambers. So Anne Boleyn, on the 23rd of August, 1533, um, she attends mass at the uh, Greenwich, Greenwich um, Royal Chapel, Chapel Royal. Um, and then with her ladies in waiting, the ladies of the bedchamber, they have a fabulous feast including spiced wine, um, and then they protest to her chambers. And this is at the point at which, as I say, Anne actually removes herself um, from the world of men, and she enters into this very um, gender space, which is all about women. And so within her suite of um, rooms in the chambers, she specifically chooses one room which is going to be the site of her, her, her delivery. Um, and this is a very, um, there are records that, that have been kept um, in terms of how this room was dressed. Um, so it was tradition for um, tapestries to be hung on the walls. Um, and these were usually scenes, very pleasant scenes, um, scenes that would uh, be uplifting. But Anne Boleyn actually chooses um, a set of tapestries based on the martyrdom of 
Ursula and the 11,000 virgins um, who were martyred in, in Cologne in, um, in the fourth century. So she's very specific about the tapestries that she wants in her space. There would have been thick carpets on, on the floor. Um, all of the light would have been blocked out, including the, uh, the uh, uh, keyholes. They would have been blocked to avoid any light or air coming into the space. Um, braziers would have been burnt and there would have been rich, um, very perfumed oils which would also have been present in the chamber itself. So she, she's taking her confinement a month before she's due to be delivered. Um, but the space would have been incredibly stuffy in August, so it would have been very, very confined. Mm. Um, Henry VIII, um, was obviously he's extremely yeah. excited about the idea of Anne producing a male heir. These are the expectations around this confinement. Um, he delivers um, a magnificent, um, a very gorgeous bed from the treasure house. So he supplies the birth bed. Um, again, the textiles are used are very sumptuous, so crimson satin counterpanes. Um, uh, lined with ermine and edged with gold. Um, they're embroidered with Anne Boleyn's coat of arms, falcon. Um, the mattress is stuffed with um, wool and covered with um, rich linen uh, sheets. Um, and there are pillows that are stuffed with down. So the whole kind of ritualization is very much about making not only the, um, the mother to be comfortable, but also um, encouraging that sense of wealth and opulence within the space itself. So let's just let's just go back a second to right there at the beginning of this. So one of the issues in isolation is is whether there's a difference between whether you chose to be there or whether circumstances forced it on you. Now, in, in the case of these women going into confinement, did they was that was that the women choosing to do that? Or was that society sort of saying, well, you know, you're weird for a bit now. Just buzz off until you stop being weird. Where did the where did this idea come from? Why Why, why would you shut yourself away for that month? Well, it was it was um, an English custom, and um, you get reports from the continent saying that it is, seems to be quite odd that women are being confined a month before their delivery date. Um, but it's actually um, Lady Margaret Tudor, who's Henry VIII's grandmother, who formalises, in a way, refines this sense of the ritualisation around childbirth, and it's quite prescriptive in terms of it has to be a month before your due delivery date. Um, within the context of the room itself, obviously, it, it's not only religious, it's also uh, has a sense of medicinal around it. Um, women were confined um, and the women were actually at that point, the midwives, you didn't get the introduction of the male midwife until the professionalisation of medicine. Um, and also, because of course, childbirth is incredibly dangerous for both mother and child. So within the context of the room, you would also have an altar, you would have relics, because of course, a, a safe delivery, a safe birth, was considered to be um, really in God's power. And as I say, we know that Anne had transgressed um, the, the, the kind of um, will of God by marrying um, Henry and producing um, a child. Um, and there was also a, a baptismal font within the room itself. Um, in the worst case scenario, when the child died, the child would have to be baptised immediately. So is this, um, is this a... Did, did she go is this just for rich women that's the first question here because presumably if you're you know in if you're making your life your living from agriculture you know sitting at home for a month is not a luxury you can afford right is this also a symbol of um you know you, it's a it's a what would we call it today virtue signaling kind of thing it's look at me how rich i am i can afford to do this yes yes it's absolutely um about wealth and about power and about dynasty and how did they deal with it? Because I imagine, you know, there is this um, we have this image now of gossipy women and all these negative stereotypes associated with it. But these this was also isolation. I don't know how much choice they had. Presumably she picked people she liked to be in there with. But how did they deal with was it was it a better time for them? Or was it something they looked forward to? Or was it just a you know, we better get through this? Well, as I say, I think there was an expectation that, you know, you could potentially not survive this, this event. Mm -hmm. um, as I say, it was an incredibly dangerous time for, for mother and child. But interestingly, you should pick up on the fact that she chose women that she liked. Um, actually, her stepdaughter, um, Mary, was actually, um, the demand was that she should attend the birth. Um, so it wasn't, it was a difficult relationship with Mary because obviously she was going to be usurped by the birth of this child. So I think from Mary's point of view, she definitely did not want to be there. 
um, because her mother had been supplanted by um, basically the English whore. So I think there would have been some tension within the uh, space itself. Um, but yes, I mean, women would have been there. They would have been um, sewing. They would have been uh, praying. Um, they would have been bringing gossip in from the outside world. Um, oh, how did they get obviously... gossip in? How did gossip get were the, were the Were the women allowed in and out? Were, were any of them allowed? allowed? Yes, the women were allowed in and out, but it was Anne who was actually confined. So they were bringing in gossip from the outside world. Now, we know, obviously, that Henry had a roving eye. Um, as much as he was expecting the birth of this uh, male heir, and obviously Anne was going to be the vessel for this, um, she was very well aware that there was actually somebody already on the scene. So she would obviously have been incredibly um, apprehensive about her own position while she was being confined. Um, but it's very interesting that in the later um, 17th century, there's a track whereby um, the fact that women are being picked up as, as gossip is being written in this track. And it says, um, uh, for gossips to meet at a lying in and not to talk, you may as well dam up the arches of London Bridge uh, to stop them out at such this time. It is a time of freedom when women like Parliament men have a privilege to talk petty treason. So there is this sense um, from the outside world, and particularly with men, that women on their own in the confined space could be getting up to all sorts of um, treasonous gossip. Well, I'm, I'm sure the men were just as good at treasonous gossip. Um, so let's go back to that point about, about the male heir, and let's maybe move on to your next object, which, which speaks to that point. So, so tell us about this next portrait. Well, of course, this is probably one of the most iconic portraits that um, we have of one of our most famous, if not the famous, um, English monarch. And this is the um, Amada portrait of Elizabeth I. Um, so, as I say, the, what the expectations were that Anne would actually be safely delivered of a male heir. Um, celebrations were already um, being prepared for, for the birth. Um, and, of course, on the 7th of September, 1533, uh, and actually gives birth to to a to a girl. Now, um, so this is a shocking moment because the country is waiting for the male heir. There is, there is, and there's been a lot of um, speculation that Henry was um, very disappointed um, about the the fact that uh, the child was a um, a girl. Um, but you know, he did celebrate. The celebrations weren't as grand as it would have been for for a boy, but he did celebrate the arrival. Um, he did show um, Elizabeth off. Um, he parades her not only dressed but also naked, which is quite an interesting concept. The idea that there is this naked child that he has to parade around um, the court. Um, so, I mean, I think he was um, genuinely um, pleased at the birth. The fact that Anne had a healthy child suggests that she could have a, child, a, a male heir in the future. She was still young, she was still fertile. Um, it was a healthy birth and she recovered very quickly. Um, so I think, you know, that to all intents and purposes, there was no reason why he, she couldn't have a male heir um, in the future. Um, but of course, the fact that she did have, have a girl um, and she wasn't expected to, to rule um, was uh, really something that was quite interesting, because if, if she'd had a boy, then our course of history would have been changed. So, of course, Elizabeth went on to be an absolutely stunning character in that historical period because she was such a powerful woman. And that was so unusual. She was an incredibly powerful woman who chose not to have a child. And that's really quite interesting. It's really ironic. transgression yeah. in that area. So she, again, she's, she's very transgressional. So um, she, she doesn't marry. She refuses to have a child. Um, from the moment that she takes, uh, takes the throne, she knows that if she, if she does take a, a husband and she produces a child, then her role is that, that's it. Her role is, is, is over, really. And there's an interesting thing there, sorry to cut you off, is that also, because we, we, you know, we hear about the loneliness of leadership, and she also chose a, a lonely life because she wasn't going to have any peers, effectively. We could talk about that for a long time, but I want to move on so we don't miss out on Robert's fabulous uh, object. And the first one of them, just to go from straight from a royal court with all these scented everything and, um, you know, expensive bedsheets, Tell us what your object is, taking us back down to the, the more everyday life. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, th this is Bly's coconut cup. Um, I think we 
we we all know um, about William Bly probably through a sort of Hollywood ideal that he is this um, sort of savage beast of an officer. Um, and eventually in um, I- April 1789, um, the crew of um the bounty mutiny off the coast of um, Tahiti. And we tend then to focus on the story of the the mutineers. But of course, what happens to Bly is that he, with 18 men, are set adrift in a 23-foot boat in the middle of the Pacific. And um, one man is is lost when they have an encounter with neighbouring islanders, and after that encounter, Bly decides not to visit any of the Pacific Islands again, and he's actually going to sail to Timor in what's now Indonesia. And the slight problem is that that's 3,600 nautical miles away from where he is. So just and... describe the type of boat they're in, because this, you know, they were in a a ship that could go places right what 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 were they given when they were chucked overboard so they're given the largest of the ship's boats um which is 23 feet long so you think about it as not quite the length of four single beds <laughs> and, and this is eight, 18 people was it did you say 18 yeah and um it's at its widest point probably the width of um so it's about six feet wide. So this um, is taking a, the isolation of being in a boat in a ship in the specific in the Pacific to a even more extreme situation where you're now crowded into an even smaller boat. So very briefly, where where did how long were they at sea for? Where did they get to? Well, they they are at sea for very nearly seven weeks. And you have to imagine that everything they are going to survive on is also in the boat with them. Um, so the distance between the level of the sea and the top of the boat is about that. So they're in constant fear that the boat will be overwhelmed by by the sea. So they're having to bail water out um, all of the time. And the coconut bowl is what Bly eats his miserable ration out of. And, he's and that, having was his, to... that was his phrase for it. His phrase for it, yeah, and they they are living on almost nothing. And um, the first couple of weeks, the weather is really bad. It's surprisingly chilly and it's raining a lot. So they are constantly wet. But in actual fact, the rainwater probably saves them because it boosts the water supply on board. It's an astonishing story. And I mean, so perhaps it, what's part, one of the astonishing parts of it for me is that this this cup ended up back at the museum. So some it did just tell us briefly how it got back to the UK. So um, Bly and his um, crew actually survived the voyage to Timor, um, where, which, where there's a Dutch settlement. And then Bly is able to get back to Britain because, of course, he wants to establish the facts of what's happened in the mutiny. And he takes his coconut cup, the little bullet that he used to weigh out the bread ration, and also the little horn beaker that they got their minute water ration so from. So I think we've got and, a picture of those here. Um, and these are tiny things, aren't they? Just describe why is it... So the bullet is actually a bullet. Describe what how this object works. So um, what they would have done is put up a makeshift scales, because what Bly, of course, wanted to ensure is that everyone got their fair share of the meagre supplies on board. So the bullet, I think, weighs one twenty-fifth of a pound. So it's not very much bread that you're getting at all. Now, one of the problems that Bly had was, of course, as soon as he fell asleep, which inevitably he had to, they would begin nibbling away at the other supplies because they were literally starving on, on board. And so this uh, brings up a really important point, doesn't it, which is the issue of fairness. Um, how did they deal? Because there is a thing, if everyone is suffering together, that's one thing. But if someone is getting more than someone else, that is poisonous in that environment, surely. I mean, not physically poisonous, but, you know, for, yeah. for team spirit. Yeah, it's r- really bad. I mean, to, to give you an example of just how difficult things were, they had a fishing line out for the whole of the seven weeks and didn't catch anything. 
you know, <laughs> no, nothing at all. Um, so e everything they had was really on on board the boat. And to you know, for Bly to wake up and find that some of the salt beef or salt pork had had gone would be really irritating, and of course would mean that the ration would be subsequently reduced again. But the then it other... seems someone would notice. Oh, sorry, carry on. I was yeah, going to say well, someone would notice. <laughs> well, they, they, they would notice, but you're in a sort of, um, almost like a sort of um, conspiracy of opportunity on, on board the vessel and that people are asleep and then you have the opportunity and you take you take advantage of it. The, the other problem that Bly had was that he didn't quite know how long they were going to be at C4. So he had to be very cautious uh, with with the ration. And how does this, because one of the things here, you know, the fairness thing is one big issue and, and discipline is another one because in that situation, it sounds, I mean, they didn't, they couldn't, to a large extent, they were at the whim of the wind and the current. There's not a lot to do apart yep. from sit and wait and bail. Um, yep. And so, you know, in on other ships, the stories, and we'll come to this with Claire later, the stories of very strict captains imposing discipline but how how do you lead in that environment how did Bly manage this situation do we know um well quite frankly Bly is an appalling leader um he he, he breaks all of the rules of what a naval officer is supposed to do um he shouts and screams at his men you know and he's a, a bit of a, a sort of verbal tyrant so actually relationships on board the ship aren't really very good so it's going to be seven quite tense weeks on on board with Bly but the one thing he is brilliant at is navigation so he he knows where he's going and he has the skills to get them there. So from 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 that point of view, um, you're with the worst possible car passenger, but they are the best driver in, in the world. You know, that that kind of thing. That's a tough trade off, isn't it? I guess you might pro you'd probably pick that over someone really lovely who was going to keep you in the middle of the ocean until you died. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. Miserable. Sorry, of, of all the ways of being isolated that we're talking about, that has got to be one of the most miserable experiences in history, from what you're saying. Yeah, put it this way, I wouldn't be signing up for it anytime soon. <laughs> Um, but these objects, and the, the, the nice thing about one, one thing that's very noticeable, I think, that you know, and it is is the preciousness of objects. And it was the same with the, the book bag for the diary, right? That the, the these things that are really simple parts of life, you know, it's just a cup that someone drank from. But in that situation, it's the only cup you've got. You know, you you're yeah. not going to want to lose it over side over the side. But you also become very protective of, you know, you don't have very many objects, so you really these things have a, have a really important place in your life. Yeah, they, they, they take on the status of a relic. You know, they, they become something really important and then a sort of iconic um, aid memoir for this extraordinary experience that you've, that you've had. I suppose if you survive it, you're, you, you probably think people are not going to believe you, I guess. So you might also uh, want the evidence. And it's, nice, it's very notable that these objects are also engraved. And that really struck me because if you were just using it as a very functional object, you know, it doesn't need to be anything in particular, but but they do have engravings on them. And was that was that an ownership thing, or was that just you know bored at sea, nothing to do, might as well engrave something? Yeah, so I think um, Bly's personalised his own um, coconut cup, so it does say W Bly on it, so that's his, not anyone else's. So if there's a tiny scrape of food left in it, it's Bly's scrape of food and not someone else's. And then later, of course, he's had the the bullet mounted. Um, so that it, it takes on this status as this sort of engraved relic of the of the time and the small boat. Fabulous. I love these small details. Well, we're going to move on to another another object, which is definitely important functionally, but clearly took on a bit more of a status than that. And um, we're going to introduce this object with a poem that was written uh, by Herbert Ponting, who was the photographer on the British Antarctic expedition. And this is a poem that he wrote about his sleeping bag. The sleeping bag. On the outside grows the fur side. On the inside grows the skin side. So the fur side is the outside, and the skin side is the inside. 
As the fur side is the outside and the skin side is the inside, one side likes the skin side inside and the fur side on the outside. Others like the skin side outside and the fur side on the inside, as the skin side is the hard side and the fur side is the soft side. If you turn the skin side outside thinking you will side with that side, then the soft side, fur side's inside, which some argue is the wrong side. If you turn the fur side outside as you say it grows on that side, then the hard side's on your own side, which for comfort's not the right side, as the hard side is the cold side and your skin side's not your warm side. And two cold sides coming side by side are not right sides, one side decides. If you decide to side with this side, turn the outside, fur side, inside, then the hard side, cold side, skin side, beyond all questions, inside, outside. And it does not matter a particle what you do with a belly thing, someone's sure to tell you it's outside, inside. <laughs> so, <laughs> I love that. So there's definitely some frustration there. Um, but this this was talking about a real object or a several. They, you know, they all had a sleeping bag. Claire, tell us tell us about the sleeping bag that you've picked. So I've picked a sleeping bag from the museum's collections that was owned by a man called George Murray Levick. Um, who was a surgeon. He was one of the kind of qualified medical people on Scott's expedition, and. Um, the men themselves complained a lot about the sleeping bags, partly because of, as you can see, it was difficult to get comfortable in them. Um, the fur that was um, on them just shed everywhere. So they had little traces of hair in their food and everything like that. They also, when they were moving about, um, attracted a lot of ice. So they became very heavy to carry when they were on summer sledging expeditions and that kind of thing. They could practically double in weight because they were holding so much ice on them. Um, but Murray Levick's sleeping bag, uh, I love because he's part of the expedition that we tend to know less about. He's a member of what was called the Northern Party. They were doing some geological and glaciolo glaciological um, work on the expedition. And uh, January 1912, they're waiting for Terra Nova to come and pick them up about six weeks later doing their work. And the ship can't get in by mid-February they know that the ship is not going to come, they can see that there's sea ice that's going to prevent Terra Nova from picking them up, so they now have to spend a polar winter in a place that they hadn't imagined, with things that uh, they weren't equipped for it, they had limited rations, summer clothing, lightweight tents, so they had to dig themselves a hole in the snow and they lived there from that period more or less until September, where upon they could then leave and it was a really really difficult period and there are there's a lot of um there's some history here about the routine so we're told and we we hear this now you know when people say how do you survive in isolation people say make sure you have a routine and i've said it to my students and my colleagues how did the routine work on this expedition so they had things that they would have to do things like getting the food from the depot that they'd made um, cooking the sort of daily routine is really really difficult for them to keep clean hygiene was a, a really big problem and they were their skin and their things became saturated with the blubber that they were using to heat and light that the ice hole but they had things like a Saturday night sing song Sunday was for prayers and listening to readings from the bible and they had three books with them um, one of which was David Copperfield a copy the copy of which is in the collections of the Dickens Museum in Bloomsbury and they read a chapter from those books every night. Um, Murray Levick read aloud so that the men had something to, to listen to. And it was just that sense of a daily routine that could keep them going, especially in things like uh, the winter when the differentiation between night and day is not what we uh, are used to on a general day by day basis because you're at the pole. Um, so it was so important for their, for their, for their dis sense of discipline and morale to have that routine. And the sleeping bag, I love things like the sleeping bag because they, they're the little details that you wouldn't notice until you have such a limited environment. I mean, I guess you'd notice your sleeping bag being, on being uncomfortable, but, but when you are isolated, you have fewer things to look at, you have fewer things to think about. And so the objects you do have, you spend a lot more time obsessing about them and worrying about them, you know, all that kind of thing. Um, yeah. So, um, so uh, and they're, they're in the bags pretty much all the time because they they're not going out very much and they do get things like terrible tummy aches that they have to then try and manage um, at various points because the balance of um, their diet is not quite right. They're doing things like wetting themselves in the night. So the bags are both kind of Ooh. thing that you need to warm, but also really not very pleasant places to be. But you have no choice. 
Well, that is that is a lovely. Th- you know, everyone. <laughs> Be glad that because you have various don't have various food deficiencies because you're in Antarctica, you're not wetting yourself on the wrong side of the inside of your first leaping bag. <laughs> okay, we're just gonna deal. With, we did ha- we had some questions on this topic from uh, Twitter, so we're just gonna deal very quickly with a couple of those uh, before we finish. So the first one: Did people really cook boots, Robert? This is one for you. Oh, I think it's one for Claire. I think it's one for Claire. Yeah. People definitely. Um, so, so I think this is probably um, in the 19th century when Britain was sending expeditions to the Arctic. One of the famous expeditions was led by John Franklin, who is a big part of the museum's collections um, for a slightly later expedition in 1845. On his first expedition, I mean, it, it is pretty catastrophic of, of the men that go um, quite a lot of them don't come back um, because they are finding it difficult to get supplies. And at one point uh, they are they are eating lichen. They are chewing on the leather of their moccasins that they have that they are wearing. And, yeah, I suppose in that sense, eating their boots, Franklin became known as the man who ate his boots. because He that's what they were trying to do to keep keep alive. Luckily, uh, another member of the expedition came back to help. Okay, so people have eaten their boots. That one is real. Uh, We'll just deal with one more uh, question, which is this question of how, so we kind of take for granted now that if we set off on an adventure or a period of isolation, we know something about what's at the other end. And actually perhaps what we're facing now is possibly the biggest uncertainty our society has had for a long time about not knowing what's on the other side of this. And we had a question um, about how sailors coped with crossing great oceans when they had no idea what was on the other side. And what do people do in those situations? Um, I I think you're probably dealing with um, sort of um, 15th and 16th century um, voyages. um, And essentially, they would be turning to their faith in God, really, that, you know, if, if they were if they were praying and you know god would would see them through um to a sort of safe passage now <laughs> god didn't always see people through safely to to the other side of of the ocean although he may have seen them through safely to the other side of somewhere else but um i i think that's probably how they how they how they coped but they that's saying always... hope there's something there which is that hope is very important right that's what hope... keeps them going Yes, hope hope is very important. And then there's a a different sort of faith that's essential, and that's a faith in your commander, that the person who's in charge of the expedition has the necessary skills either to get you there or actually to know when to turn back. Okay, um, and that's a Sue. I think you had a comment on this in the context of childbirth. Yes, yes, I did. I, I, I think it's it's exactly the same for for women in the uh, 15th and 16th century. Um, you are entering um, uh, 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 a kind of period in your life where um, you really don't know what the outcome is going to be. The expectation is that you will be safely delivered, you will come out the other side, um, but that's not guaranteed. And you have to put your faith not only in God but in the women of the bedchamber, because they are the people who are going to safely deliver you of your child. So even though there's an uncertain outcome, it's your team that is going to keep you going, that you you rely on your team. There is so much to discuss on this, and we have run out of time. Um, but thank you all so much. Uh, we There'll be even more episodes on different topics. We'll be back every week with lots more from the museum's collections. And if again, if there's a question that you've got or a subject you'd like us to talk about, please get in contact with Raw Museums Greenwich on Twitter, Instagram or Facebook. If you search for Raw Museums Greenwich on any of those, you'll find us. And there, the website is still there. The museum buildings may be shut, but there is loads of stuff on the website. Uh, that's rmg.co.uk. Uh, there are blogs about um, the story of Robinson Crusoe, which was inspired by a real shipwrecked castaway and plenty of other stories and blogs and activities around the object, all under the title Museum at Home. So please do take a look at all of that. Next week on this podcast, we will be dealing with the exploration of the unknown of the sea, space and the South Pole. Um, But until then, thank you so much to our fabulous curators, uh, Sue Pritchard, Robert Blythe and Claire Warrior. Thank you very, very much to Simon Kane for the readings. 
and thank you all for thank you all for listening.